I invite you all to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance uh, to be led by Nylea and Nalani Johnson. Uh, we will then remain standing for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda this evening is to consider the agenda. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. All right. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes, ma'am. Um, I noticed that um, board member comments were not on the agenda. That's right. This is a work session, um, and we're going to have, uh, when time allows going forward, we'll have board member comments at every meeting. Uh, but when the agenda is going to be filled with work session, the second meeting of the month, uh, that will be one of the items that will um, wait until the next meeting. Thank you. Very good. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at regularly scheduled board meetings. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards uh, for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight. <laughs> Bring that speaker down. Diana Bergman. Tricia Roberts. Deborah Rayner. Brian Fisher. Jason Vittori. Steve McIntyre. Or McIntyre. <laughs> Monique Stins. Bash Farone. All right, those will be our speakers for this evening. Uh, next on our agenda are items E and F. Both of them are special orders of business. And I ask Ms. White and Mr. McDaniels to first join me. This uh, special um, order of business is the portrait unveiling for uh, former board chair Charles McDaniels. Mr. McDaniels served from 2014 to 2015 as our vice chair, and then from December 15 to December 2016 as chair of the Board of Education. A tradition is that following one's retirement from the office of chair, a formal portrait is done and placed with the other former officer's portraits in room two, 123 across the hall. At this time, on behalf of the board, I would ask everyone to acknowledge the leadership and dedication that Mr. McDaniels provided to the board and the school system during his tenure as board chair. We, of course, also appreciate his continued work and his service as a member of the board. So is it time for the unveil, or do you want to do it? 
Thank you. Um, it certainly was an extreme honor to serve as chair of the Board of Education. And I want to thank my fellow board members for giving me that opportunity. Also, I want to thank my wife, who's here, Yvonne, for the support that my family gave during that time. And also to say that during that time, I gained an extreme uh, uh, appreciation for the great work of the staff, uh, administrators, and teachers, and uh, and even the Education Foundation uh, during that time uh, uh, serving. Uh, the students of Baltimore County are very fortunate to have such talented people working uh, with them. And lastly, I'd just like to say, in addition to leaving this uh, portrait behind, I'd like to leave behind something that will enhance the educational journey of the students of Baltimore County, especially about things that I'm passionate about and which include um, having high expectations for all the kids around Baltimore County and having equal access to programs uh, that are demanding and challenging for all our kids and then encouraging studies and uh, careers in the STEM field because I think engineers are cool. <laughs> so thank you for your support. So the next order of business is to recognize former board member Marisol Johnson. As she comes up, I'm going to show the portrait to the board members. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> there you go. Oh, oh good. Yeah. <laughs> is this really Chuck or is that Chuck? Oh, uh, well, it's a good job. He's got a slow down. That's terrible. Yeah. You said you said something that the woman who does it apparently doesn't. Can you know, hold the black, Steve? All right. First, before before I begin, I want to recognize a couple of important people in the audience here to share this day with Ms. Johnson, and they are his her husband uh, Malwan, and also importantly. Her dad, Jim Sasadek, who was a board member and, matter of fact, was the chair of our school board at one time. So, welcome to you two. So, here's the resolution that I first ask for a motion about. So moved. <laughs> Is there a second to second. adopt the resolution? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Now it's a real resolution. <laughs> Whereas Marisol A. Johnson has served as a member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County with distinction and honor from July 2013 through June 2017. And whereas she served as vice chair of the Board of Education since December 2016. And whereas Ms. Johnson has provided exemplary service and dedication to the students, parents, and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools. And whereas she was integral in having the board adopt the first equity, for the first time, an equity policy. And whereas through her numerous visits to schools and her interactions with students, staff, and parents, Ms. Johnson always brought the voices of stakeholders to board decisions. And whereas she has served on the following Board of Education Committees, Policy and Review Committee, and the Curriculum Committee, where she uh, served as chair. And whereas Ms. Johnson has committed her time and expertise to the Baltimore County Public Schools community, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County, herewith assembled in regular session on the 22nd of August, 2017, recognizes the outstanding contributions of Marisol E. Johnson. And be it further resolved that the Board does herewith extend its deepest, deepest appreciation and gratitude for her dedication, loyalty, and service, and further extends its best wishes for good health, happiness, and continued success in her future endeavors. Thank you very much. I've had the pleasure of serving under um, three. I, uh, Ed was an amazing, or is an amazing chair, and David Yulfelder, and uh, Mr. McDaniel. So this, it was a pleasure um, being on the board. I want to just kind of thank my family for their patience and honesty. First and foremost, my husband, who did a lot of the pickups and drop-offs and sports and teachers stuff with the, with the kids in the school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, my kids with their for their patience and honesty too. You want to stand up, kids? <laughs> um, they were extremely patient and extremely honest. I remember one day I, I couldn't make it to my oldest daughter Nevaeh.
things at school. And she said, that's okay, mom, you can go take care of all the other 113,000 students in the county. <laughs> so a little bit of guilt there. But, um, <laughs> but I, I thank my family, my dad, who I didn't tell a lot of people that my dad was the board president because I wanted to have earned this on my own, but my dad was the board chair or president back then, I guess. Um, and so I get to look at his picture on the wall every evening that we would eat dinner. So um, I thank you for kind of forging the way and teaching me the value of education. And my mom, who isn't here also, was a, was a school teacher and principal for many years, who also taught me the value of education. And as I look at the friendly staff and uh, here that's here that were more than patient with me, especially Debbie, who I contacted more than once about the same thing <laughs> over and over. She was very patient. Um, and then people that, just looking at these faces, the women in this room who inspire me and continue to inspire me, and um, the men, and the students, and the teachers, and the principals. Um, I'm just thankful and grateful to have had the opportunity to serve. So thank you very much. And now we'll invite our friend Debbie Phelps. Thank you very much. Ms. Johnson, on behalf of the Education Foundation and the entire Baltimore County Public School District, we want to gift you this book, Building the Future, which showcases 173 schools in Baltimore County and all by superintendent. It has been signed by author Farrell Maddox, and we greatly appreciate your service to every student in every school in our school district. Congratulations. That was wonderful. The next item is uh, public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we refer concerns to um, the superintendent for follow-up. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employ employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. It, uh, I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that the time has expired. Uh, first, we'll have the advisory and stakeholder um, uh, comments and the first is the Baltimore County Student Council and I ask Jake Turner and Noreen Bodwe to come forward. Good evening board. Um, my name is Jake Turner and I'm the president of the Baltimore County Student Councils. Uh, good evening. I'm Noreen Badwe and I'm the public relations director of the Baltimore County Student Councils. Um, today we have a few short things to go over. Um, the first of which is that we will be holding our first executive board meeting on the 29th of October. Um, at this meeting we will be planning for the busy year ahead and we will be doing team building exercises in order to get to know each of the 33 student leaders um, that are serving on our executive board better. Um, these student leaders come from all corners of the county and we're really excited to work with each different one to fight for the issues that are occurring in their schools. Uh, in addition to that, we're really glad that we had the opportunity for several students from Baltimore County to attend the MASC, or the Maryland Association of Student Councils Advance, which is a three-day conference held in Montgomery County. And students had the opportunity to get certified to teach workshops at MASC's events, as well as we had our um, MASC's first executive board meeting for the year. 
Um, additionally, we just won a bid to host the Maryland Association of Student Councils convention for the next school year, or for this school year rather. Um, this, this convention is an annual three-day, two-night conference that brings together student leaders from all across Maryland. We're really looking forward to hosting this event and are grateful for the board's support in this venture. Um, lastly, the SMOB, Josie Schaefer and I, will be visiting schools um, around the county. We are in the uh, midst of planning this right now, and we are looking forward to taking the issues that are, we are hearing from students and working on them as a, count, as a student council to fight for them. Thank you so much for having us. Thank Thanks very much. Our next speaker is uh, the representative from TABCO, and that's Glenn Gallant. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and fellow board members. Uh, board members, my name is Glenn Galante. I'm the executive director for TAPCO, speaking on behalf of Abby Baton, who could not be here. I think the uh, new teacher orientation wore her out this morning. <laughs> new teacher orientation began this morning. As always, it was exciting and uplifting to see all those new faces ready to start their teaching careers or continue their uh, teaching careers in Baltimore County. They are the future and we need to nurture them and help them in every way we can and help them with the transition to the county. And I'm not sure if I'm getting old, but they really do look young. <laughs> Been doing this a long time. Tonight's uh, meeting is all about the fiscal 19 uh, capital budget. We are fortunate in Baltimore County to have county co government that understands the need not only for air conditioning in all our schools, but upgraded facilities and new and replacement facilities. This year, we only have 13 schools left without air conditioning. Considering how many schools were out air conditioning seven years ago, we've come a long way in a short amount of time. Looking at item J on the capital budget work session, there are 34 items on the list. Some of those schools are in the beginning phase, so there's no money allocated to them, while some schools are already being completed and are on the list because the money was already allocated for those schools. Since Baltimore County has one of the oldest school inventories in the state, these changes are needed. Our hope is that the state will fully fund their portion of the capital budget so we can bring all our facilities into the 21st century. Thank you, and let's have a great start to the school year. Thank you, Mr. Galante. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and that's Jane Lee. Good evening, Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members. Last time I was here, I was here as the Vice President of PTA Council. I'm not sure if I'm happy or sad to tell you that I'm now here officially as the President of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. I will be serving the rest of Mr. Young's term. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am the mother of two former Baltimore County Public School students, one a six-year teacher, secondary ed, County, and the other a 2017 graduate of SUNY Purchase with a degree in journalism and a degree in arts management. And looking <laughs> um, we were represented today at the new teacher orientation and we will be there tomorrow. Um, we are hoping to put a stronger T in PTA this year. On September 28th, we will be holding our fall reception and workshops. You should all be getting your invitation if you haven't already. We will be meeting the first week of September to set our goals for the year and our priorities, at which time I can come here and speak more freely, since I can't speak my mind anymore and I can only speak that of the organization. I have, I think I told you I had about 150 emails a day last time. I now have over 250 a day and I cannot keep up with them. I may need an assistant soon. I don't know how you did it, Emery. Um, but then again, you had easier working hours than I do. Um, I have had issues with behavior emails, restraints, hunger, health and safety, screen time, sleep. I've had issues that we can't get involved in and they don't end. Um, I believe in delegating work, so you may not always see me, but you will see someone from the PTA Council at every event, every board meeting, every forum, and we plan on speaking out and speaking loud and representing our membership. I look forward to a great year and working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education. That's Julie miller breets
Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. There are a lot of new faces on the board, as well as old faces in new places, so I extend my welcome and congratulations to you all. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Julie miller Bretz, and I am the chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, also known as the GTCAC. I have three children who have benefited and continue to benefit from a BCPS education. My oldest, a BCPS graduate, will be a sophomore at Northeastern University. My middle child is a rising senior, and my youngest will be a friend freshman at Towson High School. As the summer comes to a close, I find myself reflecting on these last several months when students have been out of school, and these reflections segue nicely with this live stream of the August 17th, 2017 curriculum meeting I just recently viewed. I was excited to hear BCPS personnel talk about things like the STEAM camps, math academies, and extended year learning programs that were accessed apparently by more than 13,000 students. That is an impressive number for some equally impressive sounding programs. What I wonder though, is how many of those 13 thousand students that were either targeted or touched by these programs were gifted and talented students. Insufficient summer programs for gifted students is a specific concern for our group and one we explicitly discussed in our December 2016 meeting with former superintendent Dr. Dance. Summer can represent a period of regression and stagnation for all kinds of learners which with targeted programs could instead lead to academic stimulation and progression. Some models we recommended BCPS look into were the Howard County Public School System Summer Programs for Advanced Learners, Virginia's Fairfax County Young Scholars Summer Programs, or even developing Baltimore County's Extended Year Learning Program as an option for GT students seeking academic opportunities for the summer. Another possibility would be to begin to work with the Maryland State Legislature on developing a governor's honor slash residential school program, variations of which exist in many states, including Kentucky, Georgia, and Virginia. These types of programs often last for four or more weeks and are designed specifically for intellectually and artistically talented high school students. I believe that at the August curriculum meeting, Ms. Eaton asked if there would be any changes to summer programs that will be offered next year. BCPS's Mr. Embriali responded that they always debrief at the end of the summer to consider what worked and what didn't and what needs to be tweaked going forward and that they will have their first meeting related to next summer's programs in September. To that end, I would ask that personnel involved with summer program development consider two things. One, are gifted and talented students who make up about a third of the overall BCPS population being reached in the summer by BCPS programs? And two, where specifically do opportunities for GT learners lie that BCPS could capitalize on? For example, are there acceleration options that could be put into place, options for twice exceptional learners? As always, the GTCAC would be more than happy to meet and discuss this and any other issue timing thank you very much uh, the Baltimore County School Board is always pleased when elected officials take their time to come and join us and I want to recognize Councilman David Marks who's here and ask him if he'll come up and say a few words thank you very much mr. Gillis members of the board, interim superintendent, Ms. White, thank you very much. I hope you're all having a good summer. Uh, I'll be very brief. I'm here tonight in support of planning money uh, to construct new high schools in Baltimore County, uh, including Delaney and Towson High Schools. Um, as you know, the York Road corridor is one of the most stable areas that border Baltimore City. Since 2000, hundreds of young families have been attracted here because of the quality of our schools. Uh, these children are now nearing or in high school. Uh, if we want to continue to keep Baltimore County strong and boost our economy, we need to plan now for new schools. It is not just good policy, it is smart economics. Uh, I'm also in strong support uh, as you consider the capital budget for whatever you can do uh, to accelerate work for the new Nottingham Middle School. And I want to express my support for the Kearney Elementary School PTA, which is seeking a small amount of money uh, to build a digital sign and would like more modern trailers once they are available. In conclusion, I want to thank all of you for your leadership. In the seven years I've served on the council working together, uh, we've made tremendous progress in Baltimore County, I think, especially with regard to facility improvements and air conditioning. Thank you and a big thanks to our stakeholders and parents for their advocacy. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, now it's time for public comment uh, and our first speaker is Diana Bregman. Bergman, I'm sorry.
Good evening. Good evening. Welcome back. Our summer's coming to a close. Um, a lot of exciting things have happened over the summer that I've noticed. I've noticed at the state level, it seems like we have a lot of new challenging policies, which forces our school district to also um, update some of their policies um, that we need for our students and our teachers. So a lot of changes happen. Um, our procedural rights for parents for 2017 just got revised recently in July. There's um, new changes regarding restraint and seclusion, giving parents the opportunity to actually refuse a restraint and seclusion. There's other things that really grabbed my attention um, this summer. One of the things is the importance of social and emotional being, not just for the student, but as well for the teacher. Teacher needs to be socially and emotionally available to teach these kids in a safe environment. And our children also need to have the opportunity to learn um, in an environment where they socially and emotionally feel that it's safe. We have the capital budget for the state. We have a lot of these buildings, our school buildings in some areas that are not up to part. And it brings a lot of issues with the advance of technology that we have to put eyes in the hallways how can some of these older buildings in the state of Maryland um, make sure we address any blind spots so we have a safety plan that goes into place that um, protects our students and our staff in the building. Um, I'm from the Lansdowne area. Last school year at Lansdowne High School, we had children that weren't allowed to be in the building, interrupt instructional time, and enter that building and attack the student. A week later, similar situation happened at Lansdowne Middle School. Um, so every penny that the state could help us to get these buildings up to par, to make these environments safer for the students, and providing access and the tools available for our teachers, because there is a shortage of teachers throughout the nation. How do we keep our teachers in BCPS, make sure that they have access to available tools they need to successfully teach our students and provide that kind and that environment in a safe, equitable manner that's comfortable for all the students? There's a lot of pieces to this. So the only thing I ask for is please communicate how these improvements are happening for this new school year back to the parents and the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Our next speaker is Trisha Roberts. I'm with Carney Elementary, and Deb Rainer is as well. Is it okay if we just come up together? She's the next speaker as well. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, okay? yeah. Thank you for allowing us to take a moment of your time. I'm Trisha Roberts. I'm with the Kearney Elementary PTA. I'm serving as the president for my second term. And we love our school. We love our students. And there's some things that we would like to see improved in the school, and communication is key for us. And we do the flyers. We do the emails. We do the Facebook posts. But one of the instrumental things that we use is a sign. It's right there on Joppa Road. It's very visible. We have an antiquated sign. It's over 20 some years old. We have to go out and change the letters. The plexiglass on the signs on both sides is the plexiglass is not broken, but the frame is. It falls down on my head. <laughs> it's difficult to close. It's chained shut. It was vandalized last summer with the letters rearranged. Um, so we were just, we've been in the process to do fundraising. Our school is not in an area that is affluent. So we've been working to raise funds, but the bid has come back pretty high. So if we could have any help in replacing that sign, that would be much appreciated. Um, and then Deb will speak to what she was going to mention. Okay. Um, I'm a, I have two children at Kearney. I have a rising fifth grader and also a rising um, second grader. Um, this will be our uh, sixth year at Kearney. Um, one of the parts of Kearney when we've continued to have an increased enrollment is when we had air conditioning installed. They put four classrooms and temporary trailers outside. We've, we've had one permanent trailer for a long time for our music teacher 
but they put in four temporary trailers to sort of swap classes out while they installed um, air conditioning in the building. But then they realized with our increased enrollment that they needed additional classrooms. And so those temporary trailers stayed. The thing is with these trailers is they were never really designed to be there permanently. And we're faced with the fact that these four classrooms are now basically a permanent solution for our school. And so what we're looking for is the, the trailers that they installed, they're kind of, they're kind of like tin. They're, they're not the standard school trailers that we've seen in some of the other schools. So we're looking for assistance in basically upgrading our temporary trailers to basically permanent trailers, more standard to what is used in the county in order to make these more regular usable classrooms. The trailers that we have right now really aren't temperature, um, they don't really keep the heater cold, so on really cold days in the winter, it gets really cold. On hot days, it heats up. So there's really not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of a Nope, you have another minute and a half, so Thanks. she'll reset it and keep um, going. So there's, it's been tricky with that and the kids that have been out there. Um, we've also dealt with, there's really no storage, no lockers or backpacks, so when they're out there, like last year's fifth graders were carrying their stuff everywhere. They basically had to haul all of their materials around. Um, so what we're looking for, or what we're asking for help with is um, getting more standard trailers in there so that our kids have better facilities to be able to use, um, to be able to learn and to focus. Um, this year actually our third graders are outside, so this is sort of a new, I mean, we are looking to help them the best that we can, because these are actual classrooms, these aren't like, even these aren't specials, these are kids out there all the time, they have to come in and out of the building, we're trying to give them steady um, places to learn. That's what I got. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Fisher. Good evening, board members, uh, Madam Superintendent. My name is Brian Fisher. I am the president of the Greater Towson Council of Community Associations, um, and I am here uh, to speak on behalf of our constituent communities and the 15,000 households uh, that we represent in Towson. Um, specifically, um, I am here to talk about the, uh, the need for planning money uh, for an updated or replaced Towson High School. And I would also, uh, as a proud alumnus of Delaney High School, I would also say the same thing for uh, my uh, friends back in Timonium. Um, as you all know, Towson High School uh, is sited literally within the heart of our community, um, and it has stood for many generations as one of count the county's oldest high schools. Uh, we feel very strongly that uh, while we have a tremendous intellectual and academic asset in Towson High School, uh, that we would like to see it become a physical asset as well. Um, that is all I have to say. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Our next speaker is Jason Vittori. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Superintendent, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Jason Vittori and I'm here advocating for planning uh, allocation of money for Towson High School as well. I had this bound document passed around to everybody and I'm going to quickly paraphrase it, although I think it's somewhat brief. I know I tend to be a little bit long-winded. Um, there's a number of developments in process in Towson right now and as president of the Greater Towson Committee, we're advocating for this continued revitalization of Towson. I think critical to that success of the continued revitalization of Towson is the success of the school and its ability to accommodate its students and attract new families to come to the area. And I think we've pitched it's Towson's time a number of times I've heard from our county executive in the spirit that new families will want to come and make it a walkable, livable community. And I think it's integral to success of that ideal that the school continue to grow and be able to accommodate students. Otherwise, you're going to have to be faced with redistricting. And I fear that that could take place in three, four, 
five years come the next election, that's going to be a prevailing issue if something isn't done about it now. We've got, you're aware, the last two years, the school's been overcrowded. I know there are other schools that are overcrowded as well, but it's the only high school that actually meets the county's criteria. And if you apply the, um, as someone that's worked with development, there is a school impact analysis that's conducted. And part of that is applying a ratio to the kinds of development that are taking place. The most recent developments that have broken ground are Towson Mews, which is 34 single family attached or townhome units. Then there are um, 105 multifamily units, which is kind of apartments, uh, rental units. Of the 34 units for Towson Mews, which is by the movie theater, three high school students are being generated by that development according to the ratio that's applied. For the flats at 703 and the 105 units that are supposed to attract families, one high school student is being produced by that. And the reason for this, if you look at what's happening up at, uh, in, in Hunt Valley, where they have a similar development to the Towson Row project, where they have 342 multiple multifamily units for rentals, 22 pupils are being generated for high school. For Towson Row, only two. So that's a comparison where there's 374 units. So there's 30 more units at Towson Row, and yet somehow they're producing two high school students compared to the 22 that are going to Delaney Valley. So either the faulty ratio is being applied or something to that effect is taking place. There's also the Towson Circle project that's now beginning its process. I think it's gotten its development plan approved. So theoretically, it should probably be added to this list. So I think there's new development we want to see continue to take place, but we're concerned that the ratio here is not being equitably distributed. The ratio for Towson is, or the ninth district is four, is, is 0 0.004, which is 21, per, 21 times less than what it is up in the eighth district. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Steve McIntyre. Hi, uh, I'm Steve McIntyre. I have two children at Stonely Elementary. Uh, and I grew up in Stonely, uh, like many 18-year-olds. When I moved away, I didn't see myself coming back. Uh, but two decades of living in different cities, um, eventually moving to the United Arab Emirates, I came to appreciate what a wonderful place this greater Towson area is. Uh, each summer, we came back, visited my parents, who still live in Stonely, and each summer, especially after we had kids, it became harder to leave. Uh, I moved back several years ago, and a big part of why great schools like Towson High make Baltimore County a world-class place to live. Towson High has always been one of the leading schools, not just in Baltimore County, but the state of Maryland, and by extension, the United States. It's more than just a school. Uh, it's an institution that underpins strong, vibrant, successful communities. I know this because I know the institution. Uh, but an outsider looking at the current facility would be hard pressed to reach the same conclusion. If this continues, it will harm us all, not just Towson residents, but residents of Baltimore County. Towson has grown and developed substantially over the last 20 years. As the urban core of Baltimore County, it will continue to do so. The entire county benefits from the millions of dollars in new tax revenue that comes from this sort of smart growth and the sort of smart growth that we expect in the future in Towson. Yet, Towson High has not kept up with that growth. During the last 20 years, the facilities of Towson High have continued to age and decay, uh, a trend that needs to be addressed. I hope that isn't in dispute. The question, really, is whether the county, co county will take the steps now to do the job in the highest quality manner, building on Towson's reputation for excellence or whether it will potentially spend tens of millions of dollars on a subpar effort. To do the job right requires planning, community input, and time. There are significant challenges related to the site, uh, challenges that Brian has mentioned, the current structure, historic character of the neighborhoods, and the need to maintain quality of education during a large renovation project. Uh, this will be a challenging project, but I believe the communities of Towson and the county are up to the challenge. Please approve the funds needed to start this planning process now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Next, next speaker is Monique Stins. <coughs> uh, 
Good evening, Mr. Chairman Gillis and the board. Um, I appreciate the time to speak, and my name is Monique Stins. I live in Annesley, and my connection to education is that I have a Master of Arts degree in science teaching, I have a PhD in biology, and my daughter, most of all, goes here to school, uh, here in Baltimore County. And uh, I choose to live here because of the quality of the schools, and she's doing very well, and she has straight A's. And uh, she went initially to school in 2008, that's nearly 10 years ago, and she went to Stonely Elementary School. Uh, that was at that time an old building, very hot in the summer, some days she could not live there or study there. And uh, due to the older old overcrowding, some trailers were used as well. Uh, plus point was that those had air conditioning but was very noisy. Luckily, parents came together and with the board, you approved uh, the, the renovation and she spent a year at Carver and uh, she was able to enjoy a, a new clean school uh, with air conditioning. The next step was actually Dumbarton. Uh, and the story is actually here the same. It was again overcrowding, uh, trailers, hot stuffy, hot classrooms. And uh, last year, Dumbarton was under renovation and I hope everything went fine, but uh, she will not be able to enjoy it because she's going to Towson High School right now. And here it is the exact same story. Overcrowding, extra trailers, it's hot, it's stuffy. And, and there have been other issues also going on that uh, other um, uh, speakers have been uh, addressed. Uh, so I think you will be familiar with that right now. So I'm, I'm just amazed that like nearly 10 years later, after we had the first overcrowding, that this is still an issue. And, and, and I think that should have actually been, uh, you know, you should have been able to forecast that. If you have an overcrowding at the elementary level, that moves over and not just uh, Stonely, but also the other thousand schools are the same, that that will uh, lead to an overcrowding at, uh, at the higher level. So um, my question to you is to approve uh, or to co definitely consider uh, funding for uh, improvement and renovation of Towson High School so that um, maybe not my daughter, but uh, hopefully others in my wonderful community can and also enjoy um, great schools and no noisy window units and clean air conditioned environment that we don't have extra days off again. And I thank you for your time to speak. Thank you, Ms. Stins. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferran. Good evening to all. Ms. Schaefer, congratulations. Mr. Young, congratulations. Both of you are lucky, and the county is lucky to have you. Um, it's really very important to focus the board on buildings and teachers and high grades, math, science, and English. However, I am here today, especially after the events of the past several weeks, to ask you also to focus on building the character, the moral character of students, the ethics of students, the ethics of telling the truth, the ethics of doing what's best, whether it's a student, whether it's a customer, whether it's a patient, client, etc. The ethics of not really hating someone because of their color or religion or national or religion. The ethics of being a scientist, discovering things for good and not for evil the ethics of building physicians who care, not really become merchant physicians looking at money and numbers. The ethics of board of directors caring about the information they receive and not really staying quiet when they receive misinformation, manipulated numbers by physicians or by you know, whichever ones that are providing the information for them. Um, ethics of building lawyers that don't sue for frivolous claims which are really destroying health care. And all these things should be as important 
as the buildings, as the teachers in numbers, as graduation rates. Um, it really breaks me to watch what happened in Virginia. And as a simple person, an immigrant, uh, transplant to this nation, I really think public schools are the only way to get rid of hate, to get rid of bias. You know, this is your, your challenge, and you can do it. Last but not least, I remind you about equal holidays whenever you discuss that down the road. Equal can be zero equal zero, one equal one, two equal two. And equal holidays is the same as equality among people, regardless of their color, etc. It's a principle, equality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Farron. <coughs> Next on our agenda is personnel matters, item H. And for that, I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and leaves of absence. Do I have a motion to approve personnel matters as presented in Exhibit H? So moved. Okay. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is administrative appointments, um, and I call him Ms. White. Thank you, Chairman Gillis, members of the board. I'd like to bring forward to you for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal, Edgemere Elementary School. Principal, Sandalwood Elementary School. Principal of White Oak School. Assistant Principal, Hawthorne Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Lock Raven High School. Assistant Principal, Pine Grove Elementary School. Senior Communications Office, Department of Communications and Community Outreach. Director of Office of Career and Technology Education and Fine Arts. Director of School Performance, Office of the Community Superintendent, Zone 3, and Specialist Board Certified Behavior Analyst. Is there a motion to approve the administrative appointments in Exhibit I? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion carries. Thank you. Back to you. I would like to acknowledge those who are here tonight who will be appointed. And when you hear your name, please stand to be recognized, and you can introduce any family or friends that you brought with you here tonight. First on our list, uh, we'd like to congratulate Elisa Alston, who will be the Senior Communications Officer in the Department of Communications and Community Outreach. Congratulations, Elisa. Do you have friends or family with you here today? <laughs> Congratulations. I'd also like to present to you Charles or Chuck Ament, who will be the principal of Edgemere Elementary School. <laughs> Chuck, do you have anyone here with you this evening? I'd like to recognize my former administrator, Lucy Banjo, Sharon Green, and Oliver Jones, and my favorite administrator, my wife, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have them all stand. Thank you, Stan. I'd also like to recognize Shelby Bardoff, um, who will be the assistant principal at Hawthorne Elementary School. Yay. <laughs> Shelby, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Hey, way to go. Very good. <laughs> Congratulations. Also, I'd like to recognize Douglas Handy, who will be the Director of Office and Career Technology, Technology Education, and Fine Arts. Congratulations, Doug. Do you, who do you have here with you this evening? I have my, my wife, Mike, with me. They can stand? Yeah. Oh, she can stand? <laughs> senior Executive Director, Dr. Bernard Adams, who I think he came here. 
Very good. Congratulations. Next, we have Bryce Girardi, who will be the specialist, uh, a, a board certified behavior analyst. <laughs> Bryce, do you have anyone here with you this evening? Mm. Congratulations. <laughs> Next we have Melissa Lingenfelder, who will be the principal of Sandalwood Elementary School. Congratulations, Melissa. Who do you have with you here tonight? Very good. Congratulations. Next I'd like to recognize Linda Marchinek, who will be the director of school performance, the office of community superintendent for Zone 3. Linda, in addition to all of your fans, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Allison Myers, Principal of White Oak School. Congratulations, Allison. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? Congratulations. We also have Christine Roberts, who will be the assistant principal, Lock Raven High School. Uh, Christine, do you have anyone here with you tonight? <laughs> Very good. Congratulations. Here, that ends our appointments for this evening. That's another good thing. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Next on our agenda is uh, new business, the 2000. Oh, we'll give everyone a moment to <laughs> scoot out. Uh huh. Oh, time to leave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, Jim. I'm catching the early bus. <laughs> I don't know how riveting this next section is going to be. <laughs> Ain't everyone is leaving. It feels, it feels All right, like next it. on our agenda is uh, item J, the 2019 capital budget work session. But first is a facilities update, and I'll ask Mr. Dixit to uh, present that. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, uh, Madam Superintendent, and members of the board. <laughs> that, that was a that cheer was for you, Mr. Dixit. I, I believe so, <laughs> because. <laughs> You deserve it, too. <laughs> we'll find out. With <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, I'd like to ten provide a brief update to you. <laughs> <laughs> Took you 10 years to say something funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to provide a brief update on facilities for school opening. Uh, <laughs> facilities operations staff has been busy with extensive summer cleaning, and all of the summer cleaning is going to be completed for the school opening time. The ground crews, if you have been to the campus, they have been busy uh, trimming lawns, and some of the campuses that I have visited, they just look beautiful. And we have gotten a lot of kudos for the excellent work that our ground crews have done. Our maintenance office has been actively involved in some of the pre-identified work requests that uh, dealt with the life and safety and code issues, and they'll all be completed, they are on schedule. On the construction side, which is what a lot of folks want to hear, uh, Southwest area, construction of Relay Elementary School is complete, and it'll be opening on time. Uh, the other school in that area, Lansdowne Elementary School, uh, that is, with the construction has started, and is scheduled for opening in August of 2018. Uh, in the south, in the northeast area, Victory Villa 
and Northeast Area Elementary Schools, construction is going on. Both schools are slated for opening the new schools in August of 2018. And at this time, we do not see any issues with those schools. In the central area, addition to the Padonia Elementary School is progressing as scheduled. And Dumbarton Middle School is almost 70% complete. Dumbarton Middle School, I'm pleased to share that the air conditioning part, we have been able to complete about 70 to 80% of air conditioning. So 35 of the 39 of the 54 classrooms will be air conditioned ahead of schedule at the school opening time. This is something that uh, you know, we have spent a lot of time in making sure that it's completed this year. The high school program renovation of Orly High School is complete, including the air conditioning, and construction of Patapsco and Woodlawn High School has started. Uh, design work for the additional scope for the Lansdowne High School, it is in progress, and we expect that by fall, the additional scope of work that has been identified by the principal and by the, the study that we did for Lansdowne High School, uh, that will be completed and we'll share with the board sometimes in October. Once board approves that, the construction award is expected around March of 2018 with completion in uh, August of 2020. Uh, there are several roofing projects that have been completed, Chesapeake Terrace Elementary, Deer Park Elementary, Owings Mills Elementary, and some additional, which is Chesapeake High School, Cromwell Valley, Essex Elementary, and Hillcrest, and Ridge Ruxton. They are on target for starting very soon. Finally, installation of central air conditioning projects. As you recall, we started with 14 elementary schools and six middle schools in the last 12 months. I'm pleased to report here that all of the 20 schools, most of them ahead of school, will be completed. The classroom air conditioning will be completed at the time schools open. This, this air conditioning effort over the last year has provided uh, 22 schools to be air conditioned and help 13,900 students. When we add these schools to five schools that we completed last year, the total additional schools completed in 14 month period are 27 schools. This is a tremendous task that has improved air conditioning for more than 16 to 17,000 students. And as you can see, this was one of the most challenging projects that we have handled. It needed a lot of design work, coordination, and what I have here to acknowledge some of the excellent work by the team members, and uh, I have taken this liberty of inviting them. Uh, I'd like to uh, name them and ask them to stand up or come here. <laughs> Mr. Plate, uh, who's the director, he's out of town, so he's not here. And the second person, Ms. Leslie Lasseri, she has been the heart of design for all of these schools, and if, if it wasn't for her leadership, we would never be able to complete this work. Supporting <laughs> her. Supporting her are, uh, are our top-notch project manager and mechanical engineers, Dean Simak. Bob Schwartz. <laughs> and Mr. Al Albacher. <laughs> there are dozens of consultants and architects and uh, contractors that have helped us, and I want to thank all of them because this is a project, this is the life cha lifetime challenge for all of us, yeah. and I'm pleased to share this done. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Very good, and one round of applause for Mr. Dixit. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Dixit. Before we head on to Mr. Smith, we saved one administrative appointment <laughs> as a special <laughs> announcement to give special recognition. I go back to Ms. White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'd also like to recognize, and again, we apologize for the oversight, but we'd like to recognize Melissa Markle, who will be the assistant principal of Pine Grove Elementary School. <laughs> Stand Wonderful. Up. Stand up. Yeah, you can officially go to dinner and have fun. <laughs> right. We saved the best for last. That was good. All right. Mr. Smith, your show. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before I get started, I will uh, turn it over to Ms. White, but I'd just like to say um, we appreciate that. Thank you. But I think we need to thank you, this board, our superintendent, for helping us providing us the opportunity to do what we needed to do for students. So um, Mr. Dixit and his entire team have been an inspiration to me because I've enjoyed working with them, but none of this happens without these 12 people here and that young lady. So as much as we appreciate the accolades, but give yourself a little round of applause, and if you won't, we will. Thank you, Mr. Smith. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this is the second reading of the FY19 capital, state capital budget request. If you will recall, it was the first introduced at the last board meeting on August 8, 2017. Staff will provide responses to the questions received from the board members. There are two areas I would like to highlight. This request includes provisions for adding middle school seats to relieve overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School by the construction of a new school in the Northeast area and in addition to Pine Grove Middle School. The proposed new school, in addition to being part of the solution for resolving capacity issues at Perry Hall Middle School, will also be able to accommodate an allied health magnet program and a 21st century learning environment for students currently located at Golden Ring Middle School. At the meeting of March 7th, 2017, the board made a motion to reconsider the scope of the project for Lansdowne High School. While the additional scope of work is in the design stage, the projected state share has been included in this request. You will, re you will see the county portion of the capital budget in December in accordance with the capital budget schedule. Mr. Smith and his team have been working this summer to prepare this exhibit and will introduce it to you now. So, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Chairman Gillis. Members of the board, as the superintendent has stated, this is the second reading of the FY 2019 state capital request budget. You will vote on this budget at your next meeting on September 12, 2017. The next steps in this process um, require submission of a detailed package to the inter Interagency Committee on Public School Construction, otherwise known as the IAC, in, um, by October 4th of 2017. The detailed package includes multiple forms that we have to complete in order to make the requirements of the IAC to support our request that is before you now and that was presented to you on the last meeting. Um, it will go through the various stages of recommendation by the IAC and approvals by the Board of Public Works until the legislature adopts the final budget in May of 2018. Mr. Dixit, and Mr. Saris are here with me to explain the details of this submission um, and respond to any questions you may have. Mr. Dixon is going to go through that. We've gotten some questions, but we're going to try to address them in, in a manner that will be conducive to all of you while we go through that. I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixon, and we'll, the three of us will be available after his comments for any additional questions that you may have. Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, quickly go, going over the board exhibit that you have and that we'll request you to approve in the next meeting is this is the first draft of our submission to state uh, for 2019. The priorities of the program are based on air conditioning, high school renovation, additional seats for elementary school and middle school, and systemic improvements. The first four priorities are the same as the board approved last year, and they have been partially funded. So we are resubmitting it to get additional state funds for the second partial funding. The next 11 priorities, 5 through 15, were, are the same that were approved by the board last year and could not be funded. 
So there is no change in priorities from 1 through 15. 16 through 15 priorities are added this year and they were developed after discussions with our strategic planning, looking at the enrollment number and in consultation with Baltimore County government for the possibility of receiving their share of the funds. The next nine priorities, which is 26 to 34, are systemic improvements. As a matter of practice, we always include them and state and county uh, government, they encourage us to include those projects to improve the overall infrastructure of the building. The amount shown here is an approximate amount and it will be adjusted based on the information that is available to us. Uh, the second part of my presentation is the number of questions. Um, a large number of questions have been received over the weekend and uh, we, we have received over a period of two or three days. And what we suggested after consultation with the superintendent, that we are going to use two-pronged strategy. The superintendent's desire is to be transparent about the question, so we are going to post all of the questions and answers on the website. This is the first time we are doing it. All of the questions and responses to them, the, we have prepared the responses to the best of our ability and the information that we have so far. There, there are eight consistent themes that we found in the question, and I'll share with you overarching statement that will hopefully help you understand and answer some of your questions or the general philosophy behind why we have included. The process itself, for those of you who are new board members, there are two parts to our program. One is the state component, which is what you're seeing, and other is the county component that you will see in December. Both of these programs have their own unique requirements and they have different cycles. The county cycle starts in December sometimes and we'll come to you for that approval. This part is strictly the state part that we are asking your approval for. Once the state part is submitted to the staff of IAC, sometimes in October, at least in the past, we had the working session with IAC staff and they commented on our submission. So I, I want to make sure that I communicate this part. Once the board approves this exhibit in the next meeting, from that time until October, there is a thick, voluminous uh, uh, document that is prepared that complies with all of the state's requirement in terms of enrollment projections of those schools and the enrollment projections of schools surrounding that schools and um, the condition of the school, the justification of the project and the cost computation based on their guidelines. All of that will be pre uh, prepared after your approval next time. So it is important that we get the approval from you in the next board meeting. After, the, after it is presented to the, uh, to the IAC working staff, then there are two opportunities for the appeal. The first appeal is made by the superintendent to the IAC, and then finally, the second appeal is made to the Board of Public Works. And the plan eventually is finally approved and uh, after the end of legislative session. I want to assure everyone here that uh, the only plan that moves forward is the board approved plan. From the questions, we got the impression that there were some doubts that we changed the plan. There is nothing that goes out of Baltimore County Public School that is not approved by this board. So I wanted to be clear that. Um, there were also requests for previously submitted and approved capture all of these requests. There, there were a lot of requests in the questions about the different charts from the, the schools for the future, from the previous approved. They are all on public documents. They are available on website. And for your convenience, when we post these questions and responses, we'll repost it and so that you can read it. There were a whole series of questions about the priorities and selection of projects. The, it is, the selection of project is not done in a vacuum. This is an ongoing project. The participants in the pro, pro, uh, process, obviously, in addition to superintendent, 
is her key staff. This is the facilities department. This is the strategic planning department. This is the fiscal folks from our, our BCPS and then Baltimore County government and the IAC staff. The discussion and conversation on all of these projects is continuously going on. And after all of those discussions, what you see is the culmination of that year-long process that we have ongoing. Um, there are a lot of questions about high schools on the, in the questions that were submitted. Um, all of the high school uh, will be addressed after the completion of study. Uh, Dr. Brown from our strategic planning and I are involved in, in, in a study that is studies a, a preliminary recommendation are projected to be done by May or June of 2018 for so at least be able to submit projects out of that for the next year's CIP with the final recommendations coming in May or June of 2019. Uh, capacity, uh, there were a lot of questions about this uh, capacity and I just wanted to make sure that when board approved educational facilities master plan, all of the enrollment projections for the future, they are included as part of that uh, facilities master plan. And again, when we submit our capital improvement project to state, the same enrollment projections that you have already approved will become part of that justification. Then there were a series of questions on the infrastructures. The state process is not something that is defined. It is not totally open. It is not totally transparent. So we all use our collective wisdom and the best judgment to see what type of project have the higher probability of getting approved. And from, a, from our experience, we have learned that systemic projects like boilers, roofs, and windows have high probability of being approved by state and by, by the county. And it also helps us in maintaining the infrastructure of the old building. Yeah. So in most of the submission, you'll always find a mix of uh, uh, roof replacement, air conditioning, and um, heating projects. That is part of this board exhibit. Then there were a whole bunch of questions about Lansdowne High School, and as I shared, the board in the meeting of March 7th asked us to go back and expand the scope of work, which is what we are doing. We expect that work to be completed by fall, and we'll bring the new schematic design to you along with the cost estimate at that time. This exhibit includes a very estimated preliminary estimate of the state share of that expanded scope of work but by no means it is the final number. Hopefully by fall we'll have a better number and we'll share that with you. There are lots of questions about fiscal issues that uh, what is the state's method of allocation of fund? Nobody knows that. <laughs> Nobody knows how a state decides allocating funds. It is all of us, we use our experience. Uh, uh, the staff has hundreds of years of experience in dealing with the state's formula. And so we just put that all together and we talk to everybody that we can to put the project there that have the maximum probability of acceptance. The range in the past has been anywhere from $38 million to $49.9 million. We are competing against the priorities of all school systems in the state of Maryland every year. So depending on our need and the needs of the rest of the system, that decides what the state allocation is going to be. Uh, construction status, uh, there were some doubts about the projects. That were, as I indicated my in update, all of the projects that have been approved, either they are on schedule or they are ahead of schedule. So we don't have any, any, any issues in meeting our construction schedule. That concludes my presentation. Before we turn it over for questions, as you can see that there is a very um, um, concerted process in how we develop the state capital request as it evolves into the state and county capital request. There are a lot of individuals and a lot of departments and a lot of um, communities, school communities and school administrators that are part of that process. Um, and from all of that, um, there is justification support for every item that we have on this request. Um, we are 
extremely comfortable and proud to submit this request to the superintendent, to this board for consideration to move forward for approval. It is certainly um, an aggressive one, but uh, as you can see, this team and the individuals we have here and many, many other men and women throughout this district are committed to doing the very best for the students for Baltimore County every single day. And we ask for your support. And if you have any additional questions, the questions that were submitted will be posted. Um, and we'll provide a copy for you of that. And you'll have time to per peruse those questions and submit any follow-up questions that you may have at that time. No. And again, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, again, we uh, appreciate your questions and we, we honor them by uh, responding to them tonight and making sure that we are uh, adhering to our spirit of transparency by posting responses uh, for the public's review as well. That is part of our promise to the public and we are upholding that promise. So thank you to Mr. Smith, Mr. Dixit, Mr. Saris, and to your staff for um, working diligently throughout the weekend so that we can adequately respond to uh, the questions that were addressed. And at this time, we'll take any questions that you have. Okay, so yeah. that information will be posted soon? In, in the morning. Very good. Tomorrow morning, we'll post it Very in the morning. Um, so we will have questions now. Mr. Yulefeld. I just have a, a general question. To you. It, it's it's got to be understood that all the, your requests at a state level have to be supported by the county because you wouldn't be getting state funds if the county funds are not there for those specific projects. That's true. So I, I think everybody's got to understand that that uh, while, while we may or may not get what we're requesting, you, know, you got to be prepared at the, at the county level to fund projects that, in fact, the state uh, will partially fund. So that's stated another way, state dollars won't be committed to anything that county dollars aren't committed oh, thank to. thank you. Exactly. It's simpler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Questions? Mr. Young. You mentioned that um, your boiler replacements, roof replacements are recommended to put in there. On this list, they are near the bottom. So based on um, what you said, it's feasible that some of those items would get funded, whereas some of the items further up the list would not? Well, well let me, I'll start and then you can finish. Um, the, the capital plan that you see in front of you is in priority order. And our priority has been ACs first, followed by um, the need for additional seats, followed by infrastructure. So you, you have to kind of organize it in some systematic approach in order to do that. So that's how this is organized. However, as the state funds our projects, they have a cash flow mechanism in how they do that. So they'll, they'll fund a certain portion of that project because that project, for example, a high school, maybe a three-year build or two-year build, so they don't have to fund the entire project in totality in the very first year. It allows them to, to cash flow their funds as it relates to, various, to, to each LEA during the building construction. So that's why they like for us to have a, um, a, a very diverse offering because it allows them to do a few projects in certain areas as it relates to the portion of that 38 to 50 million dollars that Mr. Dixon indicated that we typically get on an annual basis. It's they don't want to put it all into one project. They want to they want to address a few pro projects in various categories as that funding is going along. And you said everything that I could. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Other questions, Mrs. Hen, and then Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. In your facilities update, you mentioned that all safety issues would be addressed by the start of the school year. That's true. Um, those that could not be addressed, is it safe to assume that that would automatically bump those projects up to higher priority in terms of um, the state capital request? I, I want to say, for number one, that all schools are safe. There are no open safety issues that we know of. If anything happens tonight and we hear about it, that is the top priority. Um, we heard a lot of things about one of the high schools, uh, and there are no fire code violations. There are no. So I just want to assure the board of that. So as these issues come to our attention, or we are there, are are identified from either school staff or our teams, they are addressed in a priority order to make sure they're addressed, and in all of our schools. However, some of those safety concerns are larger than just 
I'll give you an example, to put $1,000 on that project, some of them are hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars that require a planning process in order to address that. We, we make sure we make sure that the building is safe, but we also have to address them with the funding that we have. So it depends on the size and the nature of that project related to how it's funded. But we don't, we don't have any open safety items that we just elect not to do. We have to find other remedies to do that until a larger capital project may take place of that. For example, an aging roof, um, as it gets on this capital project, we have to maintain that roof until we can replace it. So if that roof, roof is a safety condition, we have to repair it, and that may be a, a temporary repair until a larger kind of capital construction plan can be in place to fix it um, uh, definitely. So but not every not every uh, building dollar, for instance, a safety issue, is a long-term state planning dollar Correct. capital yes, item. Sir. Correct. Correct. But so there's other sources of monies other than this chart of items. Of course. And it depends on what solutions required. If it does require a larger investment, such as would be appropriate for the capital plan, that would be prioritized yeah. given that there are safety issues. That's right. For instance, the water leaking onto the electrical equipment at Towson High School. Correct. That was a fire code violation. Yeah. How has that been addressed? Well, we have eliminated the source of leak temporarily. That's the first thing we have done, and we are in the process of designing for the permanent cure. Thank you. And this is a good opportunity for our new board members. Um, we're talking specifically now about the capital funding. Some of those immediate uh, emergency issues related to safety are also handled out of the operating dollars in Mr. Dixit budget. budget. So we're talking about two different pools. They're totally separate. The capital, the capital fund is a totally separate fund, and then we also have operating maintenance dollars that are, that are earmarked for safety issues that come up throughout the year. And if they cannot be managed through the operating budget at some point in time and they're larger projects, they find their way onto the state capital request for us on, as well as the county request. Then is it true that safety issues would automatically bump those projects up in terms of prioritization? That has been our relationship thus far with the county, as we have uh, safety issues that we have and that require um, additional resources. We work with them, and they, and in our partnership with the superintendent and the, and the county executive, we've been able to work through those issues together. Have all safety issues requiring capital investment been included in this list of 34 um, issues that are before us? In all the of the immediate request? ones. I mean, it, um, certainly we're going to have a host of issues, but not all of them are considered immediate safety issues. They may be other kind of issues related to a leaky roof. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's a safety issue. It could be depending on where it's leaking, how it's leaking, and things of that nature. So there, some of them are safety, and some of them are maintenance, and some of them are general maintenance. So they fall in various categories. All of the safety matters have been addressed and will get addressed on an ongoing basis when they're identified and working with the school administration and the facilities and maintenance teams. So there are no urgent safety issues that would no. require capital investment that are not included on um, this let's list. Let's just just make sure That's we're so just make sure we're clear. Immediate safety issues are out of the operating budget of maintenance, and that's not what we're talking about tonight. Correct. I'm clear on that. I'm asking about safety improvements that require capital investment, so such long as a new roof. So long-term plans, and that's not necessarily a safety issue, a, a, a roof repair. So, um, uh, but uh, last question. Restate it. Or you, you're square. I'm, I'm square. Okay. And Ms. an example of that Mrs. is that what Mrs. happened. Miller's. Okay. The, the, what happened when we had the snow damage at Pikesville Middle? That was a roof that we had to fix. It, we, we couldn't wait for any capital dollars because that, that meant that that school could not open until that fi was fixed. So we had to go to the county and say, we got to fix, we have to fix this building n now in order to get that, that building fixed. So we don't have them, we don't have those roof issues like that just outstanding. We, we work on them when they come up, when they're, when they're available and work through the money as we move through that process. And so. it's great to hear that the Towson roof issue has been addressed. So thank you both. Okay. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, some of the questions that were submitted by board members really require conversations. So uh, we're going to get answers tomorrow. Will there be an opportunity for some follow-up questions, maybe, you know, in it, on a weekly schedule or something? I'll uh, refer to the chair or the superintendent on it. Certainly, if you have follow-up questions, you can field them to us just as we, you did with this past week, and then we can get the information to you perhaps in a Friday update. 
Okay. Ed, can I make um, a point? Excuse me. One of the uh, questions I have that I did not ask, um, although it's related, I asked a lot of questions about priority. Mm -hmm. And I think it will be really helpful for board members to get a sense of what your formula is, what your criteria is. Um, because when I look at this, I don't see a correlation, or at least it's not uh, readily identifiable, a correlation between, say, a building score and, and the priority list, or even uh, the percent of uh, SRC and, and additional seats being added. So when we look at this as board members, we don't see the rhyme or reason for this priority order. So my question really is, is there some master running list, an internal BCPS list of our projects, upcoming projects, their priority order, that, you know, this might have a lot of strategy to it, you know, so it doesn't maybe not reflect exactly what our priority is because there's strategy involved, but we should have a running list that doesn't change until those needs are met. Is there a document like that? Does let me, it exist? Let me try to answer the question a little bit differently. Um, the facilities assessment that was done in 2014 is a tool that we use. The internal and external assessments that we utilize with, con with contractors as well as Mr. Dixit's multiple teams who assess buildings with the administrations of those schools is an item that we use. We don't have one specific document that drives, that drives this. This is a host of a lot of different inputs. Um, working with the strategic planning folks from Dr. Rose Brown's office as well as the planning offices at the county to look at trends that are happening, to looking at, looking at um, aging facilities. All of that is a part of the decisions in order to put together the capital plan because the funding for the capital plan sort of depends on um, the available dollars and the priority needs of that. So there is not one document that we have other than the work that has been done with the Schools for Our Future, which has been our roadmap for the last 10 years or so as we move through this process. That's been the tools that have been assembled in order to work on a solid capital plan on an annual basis. So no one document, but it's a host of documents, inputs, investigations, inquiries, um, comments and feedbacks from communities that all feed into that so that we can have a, a more equitable approach as we move through that. Okay, thank also, you. Also, Ms. Miller, as you take a look at the, the list before you, the priorities of the capital program mm -hmm. focus on air conditioning, they focus on high school renovation, they focus on additional elementary school seats, additional middle school seats, and systemic improvements. Those are the priorities, and that's how this document has been developed. Yeah, I, I understand that it's more um, within those categories. You know, like one of my questions, why is Kenwood High number two for air conditioning? You know, it's things like that. Um, just looking at these lists and I look at what we talked about, um, you and I had a conversation about Colgate Elementary. Colgate Elementary has the worst building score in the county but it's at number 15 on our list. And if the state has to fund according to our priority list, they would have to fund us $111 million in order to get down to Colgate Elementary. So, and of course, we don't expect <coughs> that. So it, it almost looks like what falls below the $50 million mark, which is everything below number six, is really unlikely to be funded. Similar to my earlier statement that the, that the state wants us to put multiple projects up there from construction, additions, seats, whatever your priorities, and they will fund with their model multiple of these. The reason why Franklin and Kenwood are there and why they're in the order, that's a pretty simple one from the standpoint of we had two high schools that would not be AC. Franklin alphabetically 
came before Kenwood, but it could, it could be the other way around if they had a different name. It's just how they fall on the priority list here because those are the two high school, those are the two remaining high school AC projects that we have. As it relates to Colgate, Colgate is certainly a priority, but it's a priority within all of the other priorities because on this here, unfortunately, not all 34 can be number one. We so have to have a one to get through this. So if Kenwood was renamed Collins High School, it, where would it be? It could potentially no, be number I, one. I, in, in case of high school, it doesn't make any difference. Both of the schools are being completed at the same time. Well, well let me make Also, a in terms of priority, I need to add that. Uh, by working with county, we have this advantage of their guaranteed funding. So regardless of what the priority is, this entire program and its schedule has been guaranteed by our county uh, partners. Or we could not submit it to or the we state because submit. we don't have concurrence okay. from the county to move the document forward. To the extent that if state is delayed by a year in funding, county has agreed to forward fund those projects. But let me, let me make a more pertinent uh, question, a follow-up to that then. Sure. Instead of looking at number one and number two, let's look at the limited renovations because they fall within that cutoff line of the 50 million and they are in the order of Patapsco first, then Lansdowne, then Woodlawn. Now P Patapsco falls within the 50 million. Mm -hmm. The other two do not, but yet Lansdowne is in worse condition. So there should be, that, that's, that could be critical. When you say Lansdowne was in worse condition, this list was prioritized based on the mechanical scoring. These schools started with air conditioning projects that were later on converted because of the efforts made by the superintendent, but converted into renovation. So when they were prioritized, they were prioritized based on the ranking of mechanical system. In addition to that, regardless of the funding year from the state, county has committed forward funding for the entire project to meet our schedule. That's, that's a critical piece. That's the most that's, critical let's, piece. Let's say this again. Everything on this capital plan, regardless of how the state funds, whether that 38 or that $50 million comes in, everything that is a delta, the county is gonna forward fund until subsequent years of, count, of state funding is there. So it, it so once, let's try it one other way. All of these projects, including the three renovations that Mrs. Miller just identified, the county has committed to doing the work. They're looking for contribution from the state from of the Maryland. State. That's Absolutely. correct. That is correct. Regardless of what the order is, this, the 34 that are here are the county has uh, already committed committed to. Mr. Can I make one other point? And and the gentleman there, they referred to it, but may not have made it as clear. If a building is scheduled to be renovated and it's gonna cost, let's say, $30 million, the way the state approaches that is that they will fund what's needed in year one. So your construction schedule may say, we need X amount of dollars year one, X two, and, and X three to completion. And that's the way the county, that's the way the state does it. They do it on a cash basis. What do you need to do to pro for the project this year, next year, and the year after? So that's the way the state does it. I mean, you have no other choice. But what Ed said is, you got to remember, everything on here is going to be done by the county. And if you remember last year, the county executive asked the governor to give us some funds in advance that they'll get back in later years that we would have been funded in later years so that we could do the air conditioning. And we didn't get it. But the county executive still went ahead and funded the air conditioning projects. Other questions? Mrs. Eaton. Talking about Tapsco High School, I know the renovation has already started. Yes, ma'am. Did they find any, um, were there any major findings that need to be addressed at Tapsco High School that wasn't there in the original planning so far? So far, we have not found anything. Okay, it's going on schedule as designed. Okay, good. Other questions? Remember, we'll get lots of things in writing. Um, Ms. Cosi, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask you to clarify what is going to be provided online tomorrow in terms of 
the questions and the answers. The questions that were submitted, we have answers to all of those questions. Some of those questions requested um, um, prior year schedules that the board had voted on. So we're gonna have the subsequent schedules or, or, or capital state and or, or um, county capital requests that correlate to that particular question. So they're gonna all be there. So all the questions will be there. But in some of those questions, they ask for um, supporting data, other supporting data. All of that will be included as well. And, and where exactly will that be on the website? Or, can or is it in that under email? what's happening? Under the what's, what's happening tab. Okay. Homepage. Thank you. And then um, the board um, received an email yesterday. Thank you, Ms. White, for that about the 1500 seat middle school um, stating some information that was news to me for the first time, which is that there were students that were going to be utilizing the school um, from Golden Ring Middle. And what was stated in the email is that it was a potential in the distant future. So I, was, I wanted to understand what that meant. So it means that no current Golden Ring students will be impacted. So when we say distant future, we're talking down the road, uh, 2021 perhaps or later. So again, no students uh, currently who attend Golden Ring Middle School will be impacted. What it means is that we have to go to the state also and justify the 1,500 seats for the new Northeast Middle School. Certainly those seats will, will remedy the, uh, the, the students, the overcrowding in per the Perry Hall area. But also, it will also accommodate some students from Golden Ring Middle School as well. Thank you for that information. What I have um, information that we as a board have received from stakeholders who have been involved in um, <coughs> advocating for um, correcting overcrowding throughout the years um, talked about the middle school needs and where there's overcapacity and where there's um, where there's underutilized capacity and then where there's overcrowding. So what I would like to understand is more information for those 1,500 seats. What is the plan for how many students from Perry Hall, currently in Perry Hall Middle School, would be going to that school? How many students uh, would have um, spots according to a magnet program? Mm -hmm. And how many would be coming from Golden Ring? Um, well, that's a start. <laughs> I think right now it's too soon to tell. So again, we, this would have to be a part of the entire uh, boundary process uh, and that it would be in accordance with all the policies and procedures when it comes to transitioning students. So we would have to uh, wait and see. But again, we anticipate that um, the school will be large enough to accommodate both a, a magnet program would accommodate several students uh, from the Perry Hall area as well as accommodate students from Golden Ring as well. So it will be a nice remedy for the Northeast area. But it, and most importantly, it's a five, maybe seven year away Absolutely. issue. And uh, there wouldn't be an ability to identify what students go where until there was a boundary uh, work done by the board. So. Well, what, as a follow up to that, um, it's not, it's as, it seems as if there is a building being built and either someone knows what the plan is or we're building a building ahead of understanding is it the most effective use of construction dollars. We currently have um, Ridgely Middle School, which is over capacity, and there is not a plan for that that's indicated on this state capital request. It, there's not a plan for that indicated in a boundary process that's coming up. So my question is we are allocating construction dollars for a distant future that we don't know which schools it's gonna impact, how have those communities been involved in any process at all related to that, and when we have immediate needs without any plan. So that those are my concerns the about. Here. We have the to keep in mind plan. also that we are having an addition onto Pine Grove Middle School as well. So again, when you're talking about uh, students, we want to make sure that all students have the benefit of Again, a school that is not overcrowded. We want to make sure that they have the benefit of a 21st century learning environment, including students at Ridgely Middle School, students who are at Pine Grove Middle School, students at Golden Ring, Stemmers Run, Middle River, and Perry Hall as well. 
So again, this has all come into account. According to policy, yes, and we have to have a full communication plan for our communities as well. Certainly, we don't want to alarm any community, uh, particularly the Golden Ring community uh, right now, because again, this is in the distant future uh, for what's to come. But certainly, those questions in the spirit of transparency have been answered uh, and will be remedied as a part of the boundary process. And we'll do all of the, those procedures in accordance with board policy when the time uh, comes for that. Right now, uh, we wanted to be up front with the community and with board members, again, because we know that we're going to the state to request these 1,500 seats. We want the public and the board to be fully aware of what those plans are in terms of going to the state to request the 1,500 seats. Uh, and we know where, um, we, where the potential is for students to, who will be impacted by the change. Um, thank you for that answer. The, the other issue with the middle school for 1,500 seats, just to reply to that, one might have thought previous to the information yesterday about Golden Ring middle school students being that all of those seats might have been made available for Perry Hall, Ridgely Middle, and now it's not clear how many would be magnet, how many would relieve overcrowding. The other issue with uh, middle school for 1,500 students um, is that the state reports um, Anne Arundel County has in their news release talking about their 10-year strategic facilities plan that the state report um, indicates that 900 is the ideal size for middle schools. So not only are we building a 1,500-seat school and we're not sure who's going there yet, um, but we're also adding seats to Pine Grove Middle, which if we're adding 300 seats to Pine Grove Middle, won't that take it up to 1,500? state rate capacity for a middle school somewhere in that neighborhood so not only are there are a lot of unanswered questions about who will be going to the 1500 seat northeast middle school but there's also questions about who will be going to the 1500 seat pine grove middle school which right now is under capacity by how many students we don't have that right now i don't have that we can get that for you but we okay don't. but it's it's significantly under capacity and yet we're building it in um, away from what the state is saying is ideal for academic achievement, for social emotional growth, for teaching working conditions and so forth. So that's an unanswered question and it's, and my question is who is deciding that 1500 is the number that we need to move to? Where is the research that shows that that's the most successful way for our students to, to receive their education? So again, I think that the priority for the board has been to make sure that we are relieving overcrowding in the Northeast area. Also, the board has requested in the past that we balance our magnet programs uh, throughout the, the system so that we have what we offer on the west side, we also offer on the east side. And to be in accordance with our magnet definition, we need to be able to draw students across attendance boundaries in order to accommodate them. So in order to make sure that we have a balance of programs and programs that are accessible to all of our students, then we need to be able to have facilities that are uh, available to accommodate them. Certainly when we build the school for that uh, capacity, the staffing, the, the uh, programs, the instructional materials and supplies will be there to accommodate them as well. Uh, if you're talking about a 1,500 student uh, seat in a traditional middle school, then yes, that might be a little problematic. But when you build it for that, then we can make sure that we are accommodating the school in that way. So um, I, I think that the number one priority is to relieve overcrowding in the Northeast area. So again, you're, I would have to get to the essence of your question about then what would be the board's request. Um, you know, if the board is requesting not to relieve overcrowding, then we would need to know that so that we can address that issue. No, I think we want to relieve overcrowding, but we can only make an effective decision if we know exactly which students from which overcrowded <coughs> schools are headed in which direction. And the other issue is if, is if um, students are now being involved from other communities, how is that um, going to impact their community when many times the schools are the foundations, the center point um, for communities? So there's a lot of questions about it that we just received this information yesterday, that I, questions to formulate and answers to get. But I appreciate yeah. your I would suggest, comments. I would suggest that um, just as you heard a speaker today talk about the Stonely to Dumbarton to Towson High staircase um, of her child, 
uh, the county school system needs to focus after it's focused on elementary school construction, now focus on middle school and high school seats. And that's exactly what it's doing. But there's no certainty in any of these plans. It's just addressing the need for capital dollars and requests for capital funds from the state to address what we all know is a real issue, which is going to be seats at the junior high or middle school. Thank you. That brings Mr. Hayden. That just still doesn't me. answer the question. Uh, the question is, what is the proper size to have where we can do the best job for the children in the school system? Absolutely. And uh, moving these numbers up, even though I know we have a middle school uh, that I was flabbergasted to learn was over 2,000, uh, and uh, if, we set, if we don't have a goal and try to stick to it, we're never going to be successful because we'll end up building something to get to 1,500 and then at some point in time, we don't need that, so you've got that excess space, and that does happen, believe me, I've been there. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do with it? And so from a planning point of view, just saying we're going to fill all these, all these needs immediately without considering what our future is going to be here, I think is really short-sighted. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk about that once I get a chance to look at some more of these numbers. Very good. Mr. Other Chair? comments? I had other lines of questioning, if I may. Very good, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, also, in reviewing the December 15, 2015 spreadsheet that the board received uh, for the proposed FY 2017 county capital budget request by priority order, uh, Delaney High School was number 17 at that time. And on the current um, spreadsheet, the one-page spreadsheet that we have, it's not even on the list. <laughs> nor is Towson High School, which is the most overcrowded high school in um, the county. So when we're talking about priorities, how can the board, there's no way I can feel confident that this list is correct without having at least planning money um, and possibly design money in here to, to understand that there is going to be a plan coming for those communities. So when you say it's in priority order, if Delaney was never was 17 before and now it's not on the list, how can we be confident that this is actually the priority order needed for the school system? So Ms. Causey, thank you for your question. Again, just to, uh, to make sure that we bring back to um, the, the public and to the board's uh, memory that the board did not take action on the renovation that was um, presented and proposed. Uh, for the Delaney High School, and so it failed for a lack of emotion. To respond to that, that's, a that's absolutely true. What happened is that no member of this board felt compelled to bring forward the inadequate limited renovation that was put forward by the administration that was agreed to by the county because it was inadequate. It would have been a waste of taxpayer money, it would have been ineffective, and um, the, it was referenced in an email that the Delaney community rejected the money and the project, and that's not true. This board re, um, unanimously did not move that project forward, and it was in, rightly so, in my opinion, because it was inadequate. That doesn't remove the needs of those students and that community from our priority list. It is up to us in priority order to take care of the needs of the students. And we understand that we have many, many needs and that we have limited funds, but we need to do it in a priority order that is fair to the students, that is understood by the community and the taxpayers, and I don't understand. And um, that's a problem. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to say, number one, that the reason I didn't, the reason I didn't bring it forward was not because the plan was inadequate. Very frankly, the community didn't want it. They may have thought it was inadequate, but you know, had we moved ahead with it, all the major problems would be solved. And yes, I don't think it's a waste of taxpayers' money because that $40 million may have taken us eight or nine years down the road. But the problems would not be existing today had we addressed them properly in terms of the most important things and, got, and then worried about where the future. You know, everybody seems to understand, everybody thinks that they know what priorities are. But there are so many factors going into determining what comes now, what comes first, what comes next. 
And the, you know, these priorities change. They change by population shift. We don't know what's going to be in 2022. If you know what's going to be in 2022, we can take so many students from here and move them over there. You don't know either. And that's why we have a boundary process. So if we are anticipating, and all the last many years, every time we built a new school, we first had a boundary process to say, how are we best going to handle the seats and the overcrowding in the surrounding areas? I mean, I, but you can't do that now. You don't know when you're even going to have money to build a school. It could be eight, nine years from now. If you can look that far in advance and know where, what kids should come from what school, you got a magical, I mean. Mr. Ufelder brings Hannah. up a good point about Mrs. a boundary Hannah process. Because we have not Mrs. done Hannah a the boundary floor. process for the Northeast Middle School. Mrs. Hen has the floor. The school to do it. Mr. Chair, two things I'd, I'd like to say, and I requested this in my questions in advance. <laughs> One, Ms. Miller already spoke to, and that is the formula that are used for the prioritization. Hey, Understandably, sure. it's complex, as Mr. Yulfelder said. Lots of things go into that. <laughs> that doesn't mean, again, in the interest of transparency, that those things can't be shared with this board. What departments were involved? What was the process overall? <laughs> Um, what are items 35 through 70 on the list that didn't make it this time but may make the cut next time? Where do Delaney and Towson fall on that list? I don't think we're saying that those necessarily are that we trust, you know, we trust that 1 through 34 <coughs> were made, you know, through a lot of careful decision making. Um, we'd like to see more transparency in how that decision making was made, but we also want to see where 30, what are 30 items 35 through 70? Does that list exist and can this board and the public have access to it? No, and where list, do Delaney and Towson fall? That list does not exist. The priorities stop at 34. Each year those priorities are developed. One thing is, one thing is for certain, the county government's dollars are reflected in this list. And we, the school board, are uh, playing our necessary essential role in delivering a request to the state. <laughs> and if we don't deliver a request to the state, we get zero dollars from the state, and then the county can't do all that it's committed to do as soon as it wants to do because it wouldn't have state dollars. Correct, and it's understood that we're limited by county funding. That's, that's not an issue. What I'm asking is, if we were given a blank check, what would 35 through 70 be, and where do um, the priorities that our stakeholders have communicated to us need to happen, where do they fall? Okay. If Ms. White were given a blank check, what, what comes yeah. next? Yeah. I think we would have to prioritize once we were given that blank check. Right now, we don't have a blank check. And so we have to prioritize within the funding that we have in front of us, and that's what we've done. That's what you have in, in front of you. <laughs> you have our prioritized list for your consideration uh, within that, would, that is um, what we believe to be uh, comprehensive, responsible, and um, would address the many needs that we have in our system. Is there additional information this board can receive in terms of how those priorities were reached? I think that we've gone over that. We can certainly um, provide to the board in a Friday update the various groups that we've consulted with or the documents that we use. All of those, all of those questions have been answered and you will see it in the request from the questions you have. Uh, that, that is the answer. So what, what you will get is the answer. If it's not the answer that you're looking for, we'll ask not something else. But that's the answer. So we, we put it there. If it's not the one that you're looking for, we will keep working. But that's the answer because this is the process that we use. So I hope that answers the question when you get it. I know you don't have it in front of you now, but I truly believe, Ms. Hen, once you get it, you'll see the answer. Um, hopefully it'll be you know, in line with what we're looking for. So, in addition right. to that, I'd have to add also, let's not forget that we have already launched a high school study for um, seats in terms of enrollment. Uh, we cannot necessarily just choose one high school over another. We have to make sure that we are being responsible, that we're being fiscally responsible, and that we're being comprehensive in our approach. Should we today decide to choose one or two schools um, based on what we feel would might be comprehensive, it would not necessarily be uh, the most responsible thing to do. So when we're looking at an enrollment study comprehensively, that study will not only identify for us where those seats will be, and many times people will say, well, don't you know where those seats will be? Yes, but what uh, when we contract out for a study, they will give us not only where those seats will be, but they will help us with proposed solutions, solutions that perhaps we hadn't thought about internally. So we need to make sure that we're, um, we're exercising 
exercising that ability to launch that study and have a more comprehensive approach to an enrollment study so that we have, uh, again, identified uh, where those seats are throughout our system. Understand, and Mr. Chair, if I may respond to that. Please. Um, so understand, and we're, we're all waiting with bated breath for the results of the enrollment study. However, going back to Delaney, um, Delaney was deemed a priority in terms of needing upgraded facilities. So my question, again to Ms. Causey's point, is where is Delaney on this list? And because the board rejected the original plan, what does that mean for Delaney's fate? And how do we get them back on this list? And where do they, they fall? Right. Mrs. Miller. Um, I just wanted to clarify, and I think you are you might have already answered it, but uh, for Lansdowne, um, the figure that's here doesn't, and I think you said, it doesn't take into the um, expansion of the scope that's going to be occurring. It includes, <coughs> it includes the state portion, which was, which was somewhere in the neighborhood of around $3 million, but it's just an estimate because the full design work is not complete, but we wanted to provide some future basis about what that additional design work will look like. So it does include the state portion that we've estimated thus far of the expanded Lansdowne design work. Okay. So if the state portion is an additional th $3 million, so, yeah. and the state pays a little more than half, correct? So you're estimating that the, the the expansion of the scope is a six million dollar expansion. We don't know that. We don't know we, that. We don't know that. We, we're still but doing the design work. That. We're just estimating the state portion. So we, we don't know what the final design will be because um, the county picks up whatever the additional portion is related to a capital project. We can only qualify for state dollars up to what they will fund related to that project. So we, we don't know that yet. As soon as we get the remaining design work done, we'll have our a better number to bring forward, but we wanted to include something so that um, the capital plan would be as um, forward thinking as possible. Okay, okay. and the board had um, passed a motion to um, to redirect the money that Delaney turned down for their renovation to the other high school projects. No, no, no. Call no. that motion. No. Is that no. not right? No, that's not right. Let, let me share that. Board does not have the authority to redirect capital funds. Yeah. Board does not have the authority, doesn't raise any money, doesn't put any money in the project. It's the county and the state government that put the money. And they decide, they have process for what they want to do. With. The state has a defined process, and county, when the money is saved from a project or is not utilized by that project, it goes into meeting our need, other needs of the other projects. Okay, I, I, perhaps I should have said in our request, not to redirect the funds, but redirect our request of funds. Um, it, did that not pass? I, I don't recall the outcome of that motion. We didn't have a motion. We didn't have it. I, I don't recall anything like that. There was a motion made by Nick, I believe. I'm in a motion about the project itself, not about in relation to other projects to uh, regarding the funding that would have been used for Delaney. No, no. Does anybody else recall that? No. I, I believe you may have brought up at the time whether that, as a clarifying point, was the motion, but it was not the motion. Okay. All right, are there any other questions? I think we have a, we've had a good discussion. Are there other questions about the capital budget that can be addressed by these uh, three fine persons here? Mrs. Causey, another question? Yes, uh, the Building and Contracts Committee back in the late winter had um, voted to have the have you um, give a presentation on the process of construction prioritization and you were prepared at an April meeting to do that but that it, it did not get done in that meeting and I had asked for that presentation to be done tonight is that something that's going to be in the answers on the website tomorrow process is the very first uh, section and I believe that staff tonight went through um, much of that process and, and answered many of those process questions. But those uh, those process questions will be addressed online as well. Okay. And the and the one of the follow ups to that was in my questioning is have have the administration considered the Anne Arundel County process of a ten year strategic facility plan, and it's where the board 
the county, the county council, the superintendent, the administration all work together using an outside consultant to prioritize all the needs of the system. And then understanding that the funding will go so far, but that there's an overall assessment and an overall plan, including ideal size for schools in the future, um, and also a weighted uh, percentage of what are the priorities by the board and the superintendent. And that's factored in to aligning everything because that would create for the communities and for the board and for the county a master list of all of the things that need to be done and then everyone would understand why it's in that order because we don't have that now right I mean, there, that's what you've just said are there any other questions yes yeah, so the question is that something for this board to consider with the superintendent and our so, staff so definitely not before september 12 and voting on this capital budget but it's something that we can discuss and we can have we can we can uh, envision anything and everything well, part of the process part is we're, we're being told that this is approved by the county. How was that done? How was that negotiation done? How, who, how was that communicated between the, the, the county and the superintendent and his administration and the board had no part in that? Right. When do we bring the board in? It's supposed to be our responsibility to make sure that these, that we ask for what the children need, where they need it, in priority order and that's what I'm hearing is the frustration of communities and also board members in trying to make the best decision so again I just would like to say that that it is our responsibility to make sure that we are in constant communication with our county officials and and so throughout this process we've been in communication with the county officials that is part of this process right now that's part of what you're engaged in tonight we are bringing this capital budget to you we are having a work session so that we can address your questions and some of your concerns as well and so again this work session itself is your input into the budget the questions that you've submitted and the answers and responses that we're providing this is all the time for you to um, have your questions addressed so again there has been transparency in the process we will uh, again bring it back to you for your approval on September in September so that we can make sure that you've had we've had adequate time here to address so yes that um, that is our responsibility to make sure that we are in communication with our county officials certainly we want to maintain the process where we have open communication with our county officials with the public with the board and certainly with staff as well well, and I appreciate you having more uh, transparency than we've had in the past and um, for us to try and work more together on providing what's best for the students. Very good. Thanks. I think it was a great discussion, and I thank Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit and Mr. Saris. You were very chatty tonight. <laughs> uh, next on our agenda is board committee updates. The first board committee is the audit committee. Mr. Uhlfelder. Yes, the audit committee met uh, last Tuesday and we reviewed uh, the work that has been completed by internal audit over the past year. We had a full report, detailed report on all that they have accomplished for the year. And we did touch on what we look forward to with some of the projects for the upcoming school year. Thank you. The next committee is the Building and Contracts Committee. Mr. Stewart. The Building and Contracts Committee did not meet tonight, but we'll meet again when regularly scheduled. Very good. Curriculum Committee. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Uh, the Curriculum Committee met last on August 17th, and we covered a number of items, including um, the summer programs that were offered, and it was very interesting to hear that some 13,000 students participated in uh, summer programs in uh, the month of July and August, and all of those programs were not of the remedial nature as we sometimes think of summer school. There were a lot of enrichment programs, so it was a very interesting uh, discussion, and we found that more students participated than we um, might have expected. There were a number of curriculum pilots that were um, discussed, uh, and, the, and the process of piloting new curriculum was discussed, so it was a very interesting discussion also. And also, we got a sense of some of the um, the focus that will take place in the academic arena um, from um, Dr. McComas and Ms. White. Um, certainly we've already heard about the literacy focus and the focus on climate in our classrooms um, and uh, we got an update on that uh, in our meeting and our next meeting will be in September. 
Thank you, Mr. McDaniels. Policy Committee, Mr. Virch. On Monday, September 18th at 4.30 p.m. here in our boardroom, our board's policy review committee will meet publicly and our committee meeting agenda will be posted in advance of our meeting. And not only will it be posted in advance, one can go and see it on our board's own webpage or if you want, the system's policy webpage. Not only that, our board members will now be moving to using digital tools as we review the many and varied policies of our significantly large system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And the Digital Safety Committee, Ms. Miller, Ms. Henn. Yes, um, we have not met since our last update, um, but I'm waiting for confirmation by the superintendent on whether or not um, the committee is changing from an inadequate two-month schedule to an even more inadequate three-month schedule. So I will let you know when I have an answer to that. Very good. I thank you all for those committee updates. Um, item L on the agenda are information items that you all can uh, examine. I want to remind you that opening day for students is Tuesday, September 5. Uh, all of you who want to travel with the superintendent at some or all of her stops along the way are welcome. Please coordinate that with Ms. Decker. Um, and our next board meeting is Tuesday, September 12th. Woo!